Okay, uh, rediscovering uh, Fort Norfolk, or as I like to call it, what I did during COVID. So a uh, brief agenda for uh, this morning's presentation, uh, introduction, uh, the fortification of Turkey Point, the cartographic evidence for the fort, uh, previous archeological work to try and locate the fort, uh, LIDAR and the earthworks, uh, an analysis of those, and then my, uh, my site visit I performed. So a brief introduction of uh, the geographic area we're going to be talking about uh, is Turkey Point Provincial Park, which is on the uh, north shore of Lake Erie, uh, just west of Port Dover. So um, I happened to cross the Memorial Carn at Turkey Point by accident in 2003. Uh, seeing a signpost for a historic plaque while driving through Turkey Point Provincial Park, I stopped and read and learned of a fort I never knew existed. Uh, the plaque read, as early as 1798, Lieutenant Governor Simcoe planned to fortify this port. By 1813, nothing had yet been done, and following Proctor's repeat from Amherstburg, the British decided to construct a navy yard and cover in the fort here. Difficulties in supplying the post, together with the unsuitability of the location, led to the abandonment of the project only after a blockhouse and part of a palisade had been built. Uh, I read a bit more on this fort, and uh, then one author concluded, quote, there are no traces of the establishment today. So I assume the fort constructed of wood simply left no trace in the landscape. And while there are descriptions of the fort, uh, its exact size and layout are unknown. And then in late 2020, I began a um, unrelated uh, remote sensing project in the area. And while I was assembling the project's LIDAR data, I looked to see if any traces of the fort could be seen. And the LIDAR showed the presence of earthworks and depressions in the area south of the Memorial Carn. I then went down a rabbit hole researching the fort's history, the events surrounding its construction, typical 19th century fortification techniques, and previous attempts to locate the fort in the 1960s and 70s. Now, this was all at the height of the COVID pandemic, and I was unable to visit the site or access local or government archives. So being stuck at home, I had to find creative ways of conducting research by using online resources and contacting associates at various agencies to get uh, information. So this paper presents the history of the fort, the archival evidence of its appearance, and an analysis of the earthworks discovered. So the fortification of Turkey Point. So why build a fort, which is basically in the middle of nowhere? So in the 1790s, Simcoe had a plan for a, naval, uh, a string of naval depots, forts, and civilian centers along the north shore of Lake Erie. Uh, one such was built at Amherstburg, but um, the plan for uh, Turkey Point failed. But um, in 1795, uh, the village of Charlotteville was founded and a military reserve was established. In October 1813, the British lost the Battle of the Thames and control of the western part of um, Upper Canada. And uh, the, the Americans then decided to start raiding uh, and destroying mills, livestock, and any other war supplies they could. Uh, in 1814, May, uh, they raided Port Dover and Port Ryersey from, uh, from the lake, uh, destroying both towns and all mills and livestock therein. And in October, November 1814, uh, the largest raid of the war, MacArthur's raid, um, seven to 800 mounted infantry left Detroit, traveled up the Thames Valley, uh, trying to get to Burlington. They were stopped at the Grand River because it was uh, swollen with rain. And then they turned south and destroyed every mill from Brantford almost down to Dover, and then uh, returned back to Detroit. And the only two mills surviving in that area happened to be um, Backhouse Mill, north of Long Point, and Tisdale Mills, north of Turkey Point. So the fortification of Turkey Point was to protect the, those two surviving mills, and to fight a garrison to respond to any new American raids, and was also to provide cover for a new shipyard and depot that were to be built on the site to re replace uh, the one lost at Amherstburg. So the archival evidence for the fort begins in 1813 with uh, General Proctor, who had just lost the Battle of the Thames, reporting, I take the liberty of suggesting the expediency of occupying immediately an eligible piece of ground at Turkey Point by block houses, notice the plural, connected by picketing that may be defended by three to 500 men. Five days later, he gets a re uh, response from Kingston indicating that an officer from the engineers would be dispatched at once to begin construction. In December, uh, General Drummond writes to um, uh, the Secretary of War in London, Lord Bathurst, that troops are at winter cantonment, so they're actually on the site at Turkey Point and Long Point, and they are constructing the block houses, again, notice the, the plural, on the site intended for the new Navy Yard. And then there is almost an 11-month gap 
Um, and this is because in 1814, the Americans invaded uh, Niagara and all regular troops and most of the county militia were sent uh, in response. So there was no um, manpower to actually do any construction. And so on the 22nd of November, 1814, um, General Drummond receives uh, Lieutenant Wilson with a few of those men to Turkey Point for the purpose of erecting cover for the wing of the 37th Regiment at present there. Captain Payne has recommended this cover to consist of four blockhouses, we have four now, connected by a strong stockade as being earliest, easiest directed both as cover and defense. A few days later, another report to uh, General Provost indicates that uh, when Lieutenant Galgraven of the engineers was here, uh, and this I, I believe is referring to the initial uh, engineering officer that was sent from Kingston in 1813, he commenced a log readout, which Captain Payne intends finishing immediately as it will answer as a defense in case of attack. Uh, it will meet an exceedingly good barrack for three to four hundred men, and he hopes, to, he hopes to have it finished in three weeks. So a few days later, Captain Payne uh, reports, um, I left five sappers and miners with Lieutenant Wilson at Turkey Point by Lieutenant General Drummond's advice. The high ground at Turkey Point presents a fine feature for a work, and I have laid down on paper a fort with the intention of commencing it in the spring, and for the present have commenced a block house, we only have one now, lined with earth, having a ditch palisaded and a covered way, which could contain about 400 men. Uh, a covered way is a, a depression road or path in the outer edge of a boat's moat or ditch, generally protected from enemy fire by a parapet. Now we get into 1815, and uh, at this point, um, the war is over. Uh, and the report uh, states that Turkey Point, a block house, now we have a single one again, is in forwardness here, as which was proposed to cover by a glacis, uh, glacis is a broad, uh, gently sloped earthwork or natural slope in front of a fort separated from the fort proper by a ditch and outworks. But as the plan seemed to look only to defense without combining convenient accommodation for the troops and the necessary appendages to such posts, I have with the approbation of Lieutenant General Drummond directed it to be altered to answer these purposes. And then in 1816, uh, way after the war is finished, another report, Turkey Point, there is a fine block house for about 300 men in considerable progress, which I beg much to recommend should at least be covered with a slight roof to preserve it as much as possible. So the block house was never finished, uh, it never got a roof. And in 1825, a block house and some wooden buildings were constructed here many years ago, now perfectly in ruins. In 1898, E.A. Owen, in his uh, pioneer sketches of Long Point Settlement, wrote, uh, Fort Norfolk was substantially constructed. It was enclosed with a double wall built of hewed oak timbers a foot square with a six foot space between them, packed with earth. And after the fort's abandonment, a, quote, few 12 pounder cannon were accidentally left behind. In 1922, a Dr. Coyne and a Senator McCall visited the site uh, um, as part of a tour of War of 1812 sites. And he writes, uh, the remains of old Fort Norfolk are in fairly good condition and from a slight eminence to the north, the outlines stand out quite clearly. It was square with bastions and there was an outer earthwork with a well-preserved ditch around the northeast corner. Now this is the first uh, instance we have of the word bastion, which is the, uh, the corner projection on a square fort. Um, the fort has only ever been described as a redoubt, which is a fortification without bastions. So where Dr. Coyne is getting this idea from is unclear. So the possible appearance of the fort. So it was originally designed as a square readout with two or four blockhouses connected by picketing, which um, basically a fence connecting the blockhouses. Silver records may, may mention it would have housed three to 500 men. That's not clear if it was the entire fort or just in one blockhouse. Uh, for comparisons, Fort York in 1815 could hold uh, just over 600 men in two blockhouses and the barrack. There was a ditch and a covered way. A glacis was planned to be added. It was enclosed by a double wall of 12 inch timber separated by six feet of earth. Somewhere it mounted at least 12 pounder cannon. There were multiple buildings and there was an outer earthwork. And this is just a, a simple idea of based on the, uh, the description. Unfortunately, there are no surviving uh, engineering plans of the fort. Uh, the one that Captain Payne um, said he laid down on paper has not survived. And so our earliest and best uh, image of the fort is from 1815 on this map of Long Point Bay and Turkey Point Harbor, which is at a scale of one mile to one inch. So not a great scale. I've, I've zoomed in as best I can up here. 
and this is from a uh, Parks Canada report, which uh, better resolution. It's not a an actual uh, plan of the fort, but more of a uh, symbol. So we have a little blob in the middle, and then this um, cloverleaf shape around it, which is possibly where Dr. Coyne got the idea that it had bastions. It shows up in a few other early 19th century maps. This one is from 1819. It clearly shows it on top of the bluffs over the point, and all of the other forts on this map use the same symbology. Then in 1850, we get a uh, plan of the military reserve of Turkey Point. And this is this red area here. So this is the area set aside when the town of Char Charlottesville was founded in 1795. We zoom in here, I here, this is the fort. Again, it's using this kind of cloverleaf symbology. So we, we have a general idea of where the fort is, just what exactly it looked like, its layout and size are unclear from the cartographic evidence. Um, this is the best picture of the, the fort. Um, this was done in uh, 1900 by W. Edgar uh, Cantillon, entitled The Earthworks at Turkey Point. And this clearly shows this triangular earthwork here in the foreground. And in the background here, you can see a linear something running here where this guy is located. Uh, this is the road heading down the bluff. Uh, we're facing west here, and this is uh, Lake Erie or Long Point Bay in the background. And this is Dr. Coyne's sketch map from 1922. So this is his slight eminence up here, and this is the spot he chose for the memorial cairn up here. And he only saw this area, uh, a ditch, and then he basically said, I saw this, I'm going to assume the rest of the fort looked like this. And he has the stockade outside of the bastions, which is not a typical uh, military technique. And there's no scale on this, so um, I'm not really sure what uh, Dr. Coyne exactly saw in 1922. So the previous archaeological work to locate the fort, uh, Turkey Point uh, Provincial Park has been subject to three surveys, one in 1968 by the ROM, one in 1972 by the University of Toledo, and one in 1975 by the Ontario Ministry of Culture and Recreation as they were building a new road through the park. In total, we had 14 sites discovered, four of which are Euro-Canadian and all post-date the War of 1812 period, and no evidence was found for the fort. The 1975 survey was the most thorough. Uh, this is the uh, image from it. Uh, the methodology was test testing on a 10-pace grid, as well as a concurrent surface collection along those grid lines. The survey also re-examined some of these sites discovered during the earlier sessions uh, two sites are on the promontory, which is here. We had a woodland fine spot, and then we had Turkey Point Historic 1, which is registered in 1968. And two trenches were excavated in the area believed to be Fort Norfolk in 68. Uh, one produced no evidence. The second was over a ditch and produced uh, late 19th century tran transfer wear and other items. And in 1975, the area was test pitted again and produced, uh, again, 19th century items. And no further work was done as no military artifacts were found and nothing dated to the War of 1812 period. So the conclusion and current understanding is due to a lack of any military artifacts, it is possible the fort may have been lost due to bluff erosion or buried under sand. Uh, in 2009, the site was uh, visited. Uh, the area was recorded as densely forested, but a series of ditches were observed in the undergrowth 30 to 40 yards south of the Carn, the same distance reported by Dr. Coyne in 1922. But this area was reforested by the government of Ontario prior to 1922, so the ditches may relate to that event. And the Directory of Federal Heritage Designations currently reads, there are no known extant remains of Fort Norfolk. So the lighter for this project was got from the, uh, the, the Ontario Geo Hub, which is uh, this image here. Um, I actually got the raw LiDAR data from the MNRF, which allowed me to do a 25 centimeter, res 25 centimeter resolution DTM. I created a hillshade, slope, aspect, intensity, curvature, polygonal contours, and a local relief to really uh, do a deep dive into this area. I created a 3D model in uh, ArcGIS Pro, which allowed me to uh, view the site from all angles and to um, exaggerate the vertical axis to make small features more visible. So this is the uh, the general area. This is the, the bluff here, it's heavily forested. This is a golf course, and this is the memorial cairn here. We strip away the trees to uh, reveal the hill shade underneath. There's nothing immediately sticking out, but uh, this is the area here we're interested in. 
So if we zoom in again, again, there's nothing immediately visible in the hill shade, but if we look at the slope model, we have this chevron shaped depression that's actually pointing due north. And there's also a very unusual looking feature here, which is tacked onto the end of this ravine. Um, this is the aspect model here on the left, and this is showing which way the ground is facing. And you can actually see a square feature coming up through here in this area. And then on the right is the, the shaded relief. So we can see this um, depression clearly. And then there's other straight features with right angles popping up. And anytime you see a straight feature and a right angle in a lighter hill shade, you know it's generally not natural. So then we can start looking at this area in 3D. So this is that same chevron shape we're looking um, kind of south towards the end of the bluff here. So we have a beautiful straight line running right through here. We have a uh, strange triangular feature here. And this is a nice right angle here. And you can see another earthwork coming through here and a kind of a square platform over here. And another right angle is gonna show up over here. And this is again, uh, kind of facing the other way. So this is that straight line again, uh, 90 degree angle. There's the ditch. There's our, our, our bank here, platform here, another squarish platform here. There's another uh, possible uh, ditch feature down here. And these are, are that initial triangular feature. And this is the memorial card feature up here. And now looking straight ahead at the fort, this is the road to the golf course down here. This is that one triangular feature. This is the memorial card feature. Uh, you can actually see a slight depression around this triangular feature here. And you can clearly see this bank here turning on a right angle up there. So what I did was I took the shaded elevation and I traced out the earthworks giving um, this image. And I'm just gonna quickly kind of quickly uh, go through um, each one in turn. So we have um, an inner bank here, which is the U-shaped bank terminating in these two flat rectilinear areas. Each sides are roughly 30 meters in length. So we're looking at 100 feet, which is a, a good length for us, um, the time period. And each corner of this thing is actually at a cardinal uh, compass direction. Uh, the width of the bank is two and a half to three meters and the max height is about 60 centimeters. Outside of that, we have three segmented ditches uh, this big one here is 28 meters in total, uh, five to six meters wide, and a max depth of, of 1.3 meters. And we have these two other ones. This one is ill-defined. It appears to be eroding away. And this one kind of blends into this disturbed area here. Then we have um, outer banks, which um, parallel the inner banks. Uh, we also have a short return here. Uh, and this is eroding away as well. And then we have this equilateral triangle projection sticking out here. And on this side, um, this has been cut away by the golf course access road. And on top of these uh, triangular projections, we have these, these uh, raised areas. And you can imagine this would actually extend out if it wasn't removed. And outside of that, we have outer ditches. So we have this big triangular depression out here, which is about 30 centimeters deep. We have a really ill-defined area down here. And then we have the lengthening and straightening of the ravine up here. And this is uh, 10 and a half meters wide. So this is quite a big feature. And then we have the Memorial Carn itself, which I believe is, is an earthwork. And then there's a small mound tacked onto the end of this ditch here. And I uh, noticed this feature down here, which actually might be the 1968 trench, excavation trench because this uh, star marks the location of the um, Turkey Port Historic One site. So a quick analysis before my time is up. Um, we're looking at a palisade and we know it was um, two feet of uh, timbers and six feet of a packed earth, which gives a total of 2.4 meters. The width of this area is two and a half to three and a half meters. So that's a likely candidate for the palisade. The blockhouse location might be on one of these two ends there in the range for a small blockhouse, or it might be located in the center, as was the standard British practice of the time. Uh, the covered way could be this area here, which allowed for soldiers to move from the inside to these projections um, under protection from the outer bank. Uh, the glacis would be this outer edge here, which is uh, similar in other uh, forts of this nature. 
And the memorial cairn, I believe, might be uh, what's called a ravelin, which was a exterior earthwork to a fort to protect a vulnerable area such as a uh, uh, the gate. Uh, fort George has two such of these. And I believe this this image here is um, actually of this image here. And Dr. Coyne uh, noted it on his sketch map as well. Um, I did a whole uh, series of analysis in my paper uh, trying to figure out what, if this is the fort, what uh, type it is compared to other forts in Ontario, which I don't have time for. But um, I do believe is what's called a, a star fort, which is a, a readout with um, angular projections. The only other star fort in Ontario is Fort Mississauga, which it actually bears a striking similarity to. So this is an early plan of Fort Mississauga. We have these projections in the curtain wall, which we see here as well. And if you actually look at these two at the same scale, which this is, this is the final plan of Fort Mississauga, they're of a similar size. Uh, a quick uh, tour of the site visit. This is what it looks like. Uh, you couldn't see anything. I had my phone with the earthworks on it, follow me around as I, as I went with my GPS. So I can actually tell what was what, but it was densely forested. I could see the big ditch in the front, that was clear, and but that was it. So everything else was incredibly hard to see. And this was the big flat 10 and a half meter ditch, which was very easy to see, but it was right next to a golf course. So, you know, someone walking by would not immediately think that this is part of the fort if it's, you know, part of golf, golf course architecture. So uh, conclusions, and this is what was bugging me. Uh, why did the previous archaeological surveys miss these earthworks and any related artifacts? Uh, the area is heavily forested, so test pitting in such conditions may have resulted in a skewed grid. The fort was never completed or inhabited, so any artifacts present may only consist of nails or other architectural items in very small areas. Uh, the footprint of the blockhouse could be quite small and may have been passed over in the survey, and the wood and nails of the blockhouse might have been recovered and reused after the fort's abandonment, taking most of the artifacts away with them. So with that, uh, thank you.